Okay, let's remember when you're ready. No, I just finished this one. Can we throw that thing away? No. I don't know what that was just coming from. It's like, hello, I'm talking to Jane's throat. <laughs> Tell me how many seconds it takes. Five. Hear me. Four. I'm just gonna go see it, okay? Go see it, okay? Okay, yeah, let's keep going. Hurry up. Come on, stop. Welcome to our new live format of workshops online on our YouTube channel. Starting out with Dan Hettinger and Urine Waste Knot. Waste Not Urine is part of our series of Waste Not uh, topics that are very useful for the homestead, farm, and garden. Get your questions ready. We'll have a Q&A at the end, a uh, 10-minute break after the first hour, and five minutes break before the Q&A. So thank you so much for joining us live here at Living Web Farms, and we look forward to monthly workshops here going forward. Happy fall, and here is Daniel Hettinger. Okay, hey everybody, thanks for waiting, and uh, glad you're here with us live for our, our first YouTube live stream workshop. My name is Dan Hedinger, I am the biochar facility manager at Living Web Farms, and um, I want to spend the night talking about urine, and um, this is a, a fitting workshop for the times, certainly, um, as most of this work was done last year during peak pandemic um, isolation. So, um, uh, Waste Not Project, just a little bit about that. Um, it, my, my goal here is to give us a broader understanding of just regular household waste, um, meaning we're gonna get into a little bit of history and we'll get into a little bit of chemistry. And we're gonna use that history and chemistry to help guide us in finding current applications for these waste. Um, you may have seen some of my work with wood ash that we did a few years ago. And um, in the future, I hope to keep this going. I'm gonna do something with paper and cardboard and uh, done a little bit of work with bones lately too. So looking forward to sharing that with you. Uh, so let's get into it. Waste well, not urine. Um, can we pause for a sec? We sure. have an audio buzzing that they're talking okay. about. Okay, yeah. for hanging in there, guys. Um, urine is a um, uh, wonderful and rich history. And um, I gotta say, um, this is one of the uh, early stories that I ran into and uh, really got me motivated for looking further into this whole entire subject. Um, the story of Hennig Brand is a wonderful story of accidental discovery. Um, this is one of those 16th century, 17th century alchemists um, uh, looking for the philosopher's stone. This is the, um, the key to changing base metals into gold. And where else to look but liquid gold itself. Um, Hennig Brand accidentally discovered phosphorus, the element phosphorus, while heating the residues of 5,500 liters of boiled down urine. And consequently, he was distilling phosphorus from urine. And you can imagine his surprise when his glassware started to glow. And he named this substance phosphorus. Phos meaning light, and four meaning bearing. So 
phosphorus, meaning light bearing. Um, you may recognize the word phosphorescence, comes from phosphorus. So at the time, phosphorus itself, of course, was not understood to be a fertilizer yet, but urine was already being widely collected and stored for a variety of early industrial applications. Um, uh, many industrial applications. Uh, sal ammoniac, if I'm saying that right, is an ammonium chloride salt that was also popular with the alchemist. Acid, so that helps to dissolve metals. Um, also used in laundry as a cleaning agent, used in the production of alum. Uh, in medieval Europe, and as late as Civil War United States of America, um, it was used widely in the production of saltpeter. Uh, and I'll be sharing more on this later. Um, of course, we know it's been used as a fertilizer, especially in Asia, uh, where in his turn of the century travelogue, Farmers of 40 Centuries, F.H. King describes his visit to China where collection vessels were placed on the sides of roads and even in railway stations. And uh, the, the collection vessels were maintained to be comfortable so that it would encourage you to stop by and deposit your urine. Uh, pictured here, you may be wondering, is um, urine used in uh, dye applications. So what you see here is um, indigo extraction. And what you see here is a lichen-based dye. So I wanted to share that with you right away. Um, if you're in Western North Carolina and you go out in the woods, you might see growing on the sides of rocks this type of lichen, colloquially called rock tripe. I'm not going to try to say the scientific name. But um, rock tripe has a way of getting hard and crusted and then falling off the rock where you can go and then collect it off the ground, right? So if you take rock tripe and you were to soak it in ammonia, then you're gonna to start to get this um, kind of purplish dye that you see here on the top. Well, that's not ammonia, that's urine. So that's urine that has um, fermented over time and actually becomes uh, ammonia itself. So I wanna show you this. This towel right here see that yeah i don't know if you can see that beautiful i think it's beautiful pink light pink purple color that is dyed with urine and rock tripe so let's get into this indigo a little bit let's go ahead and do this uh, a really um exciting and kind of fascinating story of how urine was used in medieval europe uh was in the um dyeing of indigo goods, indigo being the color of um, blue jeans. So um, what I've done here is taken some indigo powder and have uh, put it in this little sock thing down here. And from there, I've taken it and submerged that sock into, that's about a two gallon vat of urine. Um, the urine vat is um, called, nobody really knows the etymology of this word, but sig vat basically just means urine vat. And that urine vat is used to make the indigo powder soluble so that it adheres to cellulose fibers like cotton or linen. And um, indigo, natural indigo still these days requires um, a solution that is both um, reduced, meaning that it's limited oxygen, and also um, alkaline. So uh, uniquely, urine, when you leave it alone long enough and you just leave it just vented to the air just a little bit, um, there are microbes in the urine that will reduce the indigo powder and slowly over time, your urine will become more alkaline as it sits. So urine being uniquely capable of taking indigo and making it soluble so that it sticks to dyed goods. Um, it's really pretty neat. When you see this, this vat turn green, um, you know that it's ready to dip your, your cotton piece in there. And then um, you pull it out and the soluble indigo is stuck to your cotton piece and it turns, it's green when you pull it out and immediately upon exposure to air, it turns blue. So you can imagine that this was quite magical 
to the agents. Um, and I want to go ahead and show you this as well. This is a urine dyed indigo cloth that I made um, last year at the biochar facility. So there's uh, some more of my cotton dish towels that I made. Um, you can see that's a very nice, pure, dark blue. Um, uh, there's a really fun story about indigo dyed goods. Um, urine being uh, a, a, a gentle way to dye with uh, indigo. Um, urine is, is weak compared to some of the chemical methods that were coming out in the, uh, I want to say 18th or 19th century. Um, for reducing the indigo and meaning that uh, it takes multiple dips into the sig vat and back out in order to get this deep base of blue. So there's multiple dips and the fact that the ammonia is rather weak chemically uh, mean that you have a really high quality cotton or linen garment that has a really deep, deep shade of blue. Uh, so much so that compared to some of the industrial methods of, of indigo dyeing at the time, uh, urine was actually uh, prized for a little while. So traders of indigo dyed goods would actually smell the urine soaked cloth and to be able to confirm that it was in fact dyed with urine and that would fetch a higher price. Um, this story is, is uh, detailed in a, uh, in a book by J.N. Lyles called uh, The Art and Craft of Natural Dyeing. Um, that's been a really fun book for me to get into, and um, uh, a lot of this waste not stuff actually stems from just uh, stories about um, dying in ancient times that come from that book. So, um, uh, nonetheless, you can see that the prevalence of urine in such a broad array of historical applications um, affirms clearly that our modern day aversion to urine uh, with our flush toilets is an exception to our natural history. Modern sanitation, flush and forget. Modern sanitation um, brought on by urban living and our distance from agriculture, cheap synthetic fertilizers, cheap energy, odor, public perception, flush toilet technologies. These are all reasons why we don't collect our urine anymore. Um, all in one pipe, waste disposal, so you flush, you, you pee into the toilet and you flush it, or you um, defecate into the toilet and you flush it. You're taking your urine, you're taking your feces, you're taking all of that water and you're diluting those nutrients. And you're making it very hard to reclaim nutrients at that point. So diluting nutrient is harder to reclaim. And what is reclaimed currently is what we call biosolids, um, which can be contaminated with other household waste or anything else that goes down the sewer. Um, modern sanitation is very effective at managing pathogens, um, but outflows at a modern wastewater treatment plant, I don't want to say all of them, but a lot of them, still contain plant nutrients, specifically nitrogen and phosphorus, uh, which contribute to, um, certainly not solely responsible for, but they contribute to eutrophication. Eutrophication is a form of nutrient pollution where excess nutrients in waterways cause biological blooms that disrupt ecosystems. If you've ever seen the algal blooms that are brought on by excess nitrogen in the water, those algal blooms will um, block sunlight access to the water. They'll um, use up all the oxygen, leading to pretty dramatic fish kills. Um, it won't take long to come across a story about eutrophication in America in the news very recently. Uh, ecological sanitation is kind of a, um, a, a, an ecologically minded approach that looks at modern day sanitation and uh, looks at how can we reclaim nutrients. Uh, how can we stop potential eutrophication? How can we use those nutrients in agriculture? Um, there's going to be a couple of organizations that I'm going to refer to a few times throughout tonight's lecture, um, organizations like the Stockholm Environment Institute, um, which put out a lot of research, and others, I don't want to just say them, but others in mainly Sweden, uh, a little bit in Germany, 
that wrote a lot about urine diversion and collection and use in agriculture. Uh, I want to say that was probably about 10 or maybe even 20 years ago. And then also I'll be talking a lot about the Rich Earth Institute um, in Vermont in the United States. These guys have been leaders in ecological sanitation and um, I'll be mentioning them a lot throughout this presentation. Uh, a lot of what they're going for is what we call a closed loop nutrient cycle where where you urinate and your urine is collected and it's applied in agriculture and eventually that urine is used to grow food that you then eat and then urinate and you complete the cycle. Um, these are, are complete systems approaches that look at energy efficiency, uh, cost of fertilizer, um, you know, what does it take to actually store and collect this urine and ship it, move it to where it's needed and um, and then, you know, what is the safety and how can we recommend safe practices for urine and how can we recommend legislation that, that makes this possible in the United States? Um, uh, urine diversion here is, is really is the central approach to ecological sanitation. Let me show you why. Um, this comes from one of those uh, Swedish documents that I was describing. Um, uh, take a look at this graph here, you're going to see the three of the main plant nutrients, the NPK um, that you see on a fertilizer bag, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. Urine is, is um, what's blue here, dark blue. In your urine, of all of your waste that goes down the pipe, so out to your sewer, in your, in your wastewater, uh, urine contains 80% of your nitrogen. Uh, I want to say that's 55 or 60 percent, 55 percent of your phosphorus and 60 percent of your potassium. So that's the majority on all accounts. That's the majority. That's very much close to all of your nitrogen. In your urine alone, which is only 1 percent or less than 1 percent of your total domestic wastewater. So you can see why it would be effective to uh, divert urine from your wastewater stream. This actually makes it easier for modern day wastewater treatment plants to operate. Uh, removal of nutrients is a big part of what they do. So if you can remove the nutrients at your home, then they don't have to deal with it. Um, uh, urine really is the low hanging fruit. Um, it has very big potential, as you can see, as a fertilizer. It's a fast-acting and it's a soluble form of nitrogen and phosphorus. Very effective, as effective as mineral fertilizers, proven as effective, or um, just barely as effective in some studies as mineral fertilizers. Um, use it as a fertilizer in your home. There's no need to flush every time you uh, urinate, so you're saving water. Uh, and we've already spoken about the waterways. Um, Urine itself is, is actually pretty well balanced for nitrogen heavy feeder crops. These are cereal crops and uh, leafy greens. Um, uh, phosphorus is increasingly limited uh, globally, so um, urine really does help solve that problem. Uh, of course, it's free and it's local. You're independent uh, generator of your own fertilizer. Uh, frankly, I think this makes you more responsible person. And uh, this is maybe just me talking, reading too many stories, but I, I do believe that this gives you a deeper connection to, uh, to who you are and where you came from. Um, Western science itself, uh, you know, a lot of talk about urine as a fertilizer now, a lot of research going into it, and the science is increasingly clear. Urine is safe. Uh, it's very safe, and of course it's effective, and it's everywhere. Urine has a very big, Potential in the developing world, of course, where um, where we need as much food as possible. Um, Rich Earth estimates that um, uh, well, they don't estimate. They they've tested plenty of urine that they've taken in through their community um, urine collection program, and their NPK that they average out is a 0 0.6 in 0 0.1, 0 0.2. Okay. Um, for their figures, that's two and a half pounds of nitrogen and 50 gallons of urine, okay? So uh, moving forward, since uh, urine is so nitrogen dominant, we're gonna really be looking at nitrogen as the determining factor here. Um, uh, as I said, it is as effective as mineral fertilizers. In some cases, it's even better. 
Uh, I did come across one trial, this is fascinating, uh, where they were drawing tomatoes, um, yeah, uh, fertilized with urine compared to mineral fertilizers, and uh, these tomatoes showed lower nitrates, believe it or not, um, higher beta carotene, and higher protein, believe it or not. Um, so that's, uh, that, that's pretty cool to me. Um, uh, average adult, these are common figures placed all around the web. Uh, average adult urinates one and a half liters a day. I personally know that I urinate quite a bit more than that. Maybe I just drink more water or coffee. Um, but um, throughout the entire year, this is, um, again, often quoted, this is enough to fertilize a 145 kilogram annual wheat crop. So uh, you collect all of your urine all of the time and you can do 145 kilograms of wheat. Um, by my rough math, uh, urine from about 20 people would be enough to replace all of the nitrogen loss from one acre of maize. Um, of course, it remains difficult to satisfy all of the nitrogen um, requirement by uh, urine at a large scale. Um, urine is a highly soluble form of fertilizer, but um, you know, it's, it's my position, it's probably the position, I can't speak for the entire farm, but uh, I would assume it's the position of Liveland Farms, that urine is, is useful as a fast-acting, soluble nitrogen fertilizer, but useful in the context of a broader soil health, um, which really goes alongside a complete system of regenerative ag, including no-till, including nitrogen-fixing cover crops, uh, tons of compost, uh, lots of intense and grazing, and of course, being the biochar facility manager, I'll be advocating biochar. Um, so that's a long intro, I'm sorry. Um, here's what we're gonna be covering for the rest of today, tonight. Uh, we'll get into a little bit about detailed composition of urine, a uh, tiny bit about chemistry. Um, I'm no chemist, I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, we'll get into handling best practices, recommendations from uh, uh, you know, folks like the Rich Earth Institute and garden applications, stuff that I've done in my own garden, stuff that people say you should and shouldn't do, stuff that Pat, the director of our farm, has done in the past, and hopefully we'll come up with, uh, with some good strategies for you if you are interested in using uh, urine in your own garden. And if we have time, I'm going to dive into um, the historical method of saltpeter production, which is quite fun. Um, and some of my projects that I've been uh, really invested in this year, um, anthroponics, which is uh, uh, an organic form of hydroponic growing, really using urine as a primary fertilizer. And from there, I branched off to growing uh, duckweed, really hoping to have a fertilized, high-protein duckweed that um, is an analog in animal feeds for um, soy or fish meal or something like that. So here we go. What is urine? Um, urine, 95% water, probably. 95% water, of course, all urine is different. Um, it's two and a half percent. Of that remaining 5%, about half of that is a nitrogen-rich compound called urea. The uh, remaining two and a half percent is uh, mineral salts and other metabolites uh, like creatinine, uh, some organic acids in there. Um, this here, this table is data from uh, a German publication about, again, um, urine diversion. Uh, uh, I'll share that with you. I've got a link at the end of the presentation for that. But uh, this is their data. It, it's a little bit different than the Rich Earth data. A little bit higher nitrogen. Remember I said Rich Earth had a 0.6. Uh, in Germany, they've got a 0.8. Maybe they eat more protein over there. I don't know. Maybe they drink less coffee than we do. Um, phosphorus is kind of all over the place. I, I don't know why they're explaining that, but note here that urine fresh is actually rather acidic. Okay, slightly acidic. A little bit of potassium and a lot of sodium. I'm getting used to this screen here. A lot of sodium down here at the bottom. Okay, uh, we knew that. We all eat salt. Um, quite a bit of chloride, uh, I assume, coming in with that table salt. Um, I got a, I spent a lot of my time, I told you I was doing the anthroponics, the hydroponics, and I put a lot of 
early work into assuming that my urine matched these numbers. Um, and then I kind of got a little bit excited and I wanted to have my urine sent off to a lab to have it tested. I did find a wonderful lab that was um, completely willing to work with me on this. Um, and uh, instead of sending my regular run-of-the-mill urine, I got excited and sent my fresh morning urine urine collected in the morning, really the, uh, the stinkiest, yellowest urine that I had. And um, I, I had read online and in many sources that morning urine was in fact more potent. Well, it is in fact more potent. That TKN is, is a, a measure of total nitrogen. Um, it's up at 1%, so that's um, almost twice as much as what Rich Earth is collecting um, throughout their entire day's worth of urine. Um, and uh, you can see uh, my potassium numbers are really not that much higher. Maybe I'm leaching my own body by drinking too much water. I don't know. Um, phosphorus is, is higher than what Rich Earth estimates, but it's actually still lower than what um, the Germans or, or the Europeans, I assume, are, are getting. Uh, still quite a bit high there in sodium, um, although albeit not as high as I thought. But... Um, uh, let's see, what else stands out? I was kind of surprised to see that much boron. I don't know why, I, I just, I don't know. I didn't think anything else was in there. So um, that was that was exciting to see. Um, anyway, so from this point forward, um, I'm assuming that my urine on my projects is 1% um, is nitrogen, which is quite a bit. Uh, okay, here's the really big question. Everybody says, okay, urine, that's great, it's sterile. You know, oh wow, of course, use urine, it is sterile. Well, urine is sterile, but only in the bladder. Um, and outside of a medical procedure, um, there really is no way of collecting urine without bringing in from the outside some bacterial contamination. Uh, luckily, to our benefit, there's plenty of easy and uh, natural, almost built-in ways to ensure urine safety. Um, we'll get to that in just one second. Um, Another question that comes up a lot is, uh, you know, what about these pharmaceutical contaminants? Um, certain pharmaceuticals, hormones and whatnot, uh, are going to pass through into your urine. We don't know the effect of accumulated hormones on soil. We don't know for certain what happens when we apply them. Uh, people are looking at this. I know the University of Michigan, I believe. Yep, there it is. Um, has, has done a lot of work with um, culturing antibacterial resistant bacteria. So actually adding, uh, I believe, um, um, antibiotics to urine. And then uh, uh, seeing how that reacts in the soil. And, and basically what they found out, I'm gonna summarize this uh, without having gone into too much detail, but Aging urine. Remember when I talked about the, the indigo where, where you've got a vat of urine and you just it gets alkaline over time? That's the aging process. So that aging process actually um, breaks down DNA chains and antibacterial resistant bacteria. Uh, so those DNA chains, the concern is that those DNA chains, not the bacteria themselves obviously, but the DNA chains of of dead bacteria in the soil will somehow make its way into plants. And uh, really aging urine is, is the most common and widely, widely used and, and frankly the easiest way of sanitizing your urine. And uh, it is nice to know that that's uh, been shown at least marginally effective there. Um, can biochar play a role? Probably in cleaning uh, urine and pharmaceuticals. Uh, I look forward to seeing uh, research come down the pike for that. I'm sure it will. Aging urine. This is when you take urine and you basically leave it alone. Um, I would say take urine. You know what old urine smells like, probably. Uh, I would recommend if you're going to do this, then you put it in a container and you close it up nice and tight. There's no reason to be smelling urine. Uh, this compound way over here on my right is urea urea in water, catalyzed by the enzyme urease, um, over time will yield ammonium, hydroxide ions, and carbonate ions. 
So that hydroxide and carbonate ions are what are driving your pH up, and it's what helps to, we, well, we believe it's the pH shift. Uh, some people do. I, I don't know if that's actually proven. Um, that uh, sanitizes the urine, and maybe it's the ammonia itself. Um, a, a little bit about keeping your, your container closed. Now, if you were to just, like, uh, urinate into a bucket and leave it wide open, it, that process is going to happen. Additionally, what's going to happen is your ammonium ions, dissolved ammonium ions, in the urine water itself are going to start to off-gas as ammonia. And that is, you know, for one, it smells atrocious. We all know that. But it's also, um, it's also nitrogen loss. In any of these cases, if you're smelling urine, uh, that is you losing nitrogen if you didn't fertilize with it. So going back to that, uh, let's, let's bring it back to that dye um, project, the, um, the indigo and the uh, lichen dyes. Um, I wanna be working with the strongest urine that I got. If you wanna do that, I really do recommend that you, um, you know, find a nice tutorial online or, or pick up Jan Lyle's book and um, and collect your morning urine, it really does make a difference. You want that strongest urine possible if you wanna um, create your own ammonia for, for dyeing. Okay. Are we good here? Can you see the screen there? Oh. It's fine, I can keep going. There it is, okay, thanks. Okay, aging urine, we're, I'm going to call that hydrolyzed urine. That's a urine that's undergone hydrolysis. Um, you can see the pH shift there, the fresh from 6.2 all the way up to 9.1. Again, this is using those German figures. Um, uh, notice something else that's going on here. Uh, take a look at the phosphorus. Uh, where did that phosphorus go? Where did that potassium go? What happened to all of our calcium and magnesium? Um, what is kind of interesting here is um, as ammonia sits and the pH shifts up, or as urine sits and the pH shifts up, uh, some of these minerals actually uh, drop out. They're no longer soluble in a high pH environment. Um, so your calcium, your magnesium, uh, most of your phosphorus, and, and again, some of your potassium, actually some of your nitrogen is gonna drop out too, um, probably. And, um, uh, what you'll see is that these minerals, this, this sludge, will build up in the bottom of your containers. Now, this is a real big problem for the urine diversion folks who are advocating, um, uh, you know, uh, community-wide urine collection. So they've got these really large urine containers and, and piping systems. And this, this sludge eventually clogs up and builds around the outside of these pipes. Wastewater treatment professionals know all about it. Um, but for us, it's actually pretty cool, <laughs> in my opinion. Um, this, this material is, is known as struvite. Now, struvite isn't all of it, but it's some of it. It's, a, uh, it's a, a, a basically a mineral form of magnesium, ammonium, and phosphate. And um, there's also another sediment called apatite. I believe I'm selling, uh, saying that right, um, which is uh, some of your calcium. But this happens when um, uh, uh, magnesium, all of the magnesium in your urine, and calcium in your phosphate, your phosphorus, um, and some ammonium uh, are no longer soluble. Sorry, the ammonium is still soluble, but um, the minerals are no longer soluble, and um, they react with water, and they precipitate out. Um, uh, what's neat about this is it's actually, if you think about it, um, it's a solid, nutrient-dense, fertilizer from urine uh, that is, is valuable. Um, it's valuable enough that you can package it and ship it and, and cover those shipping expenses. That's a big problem with urine now is that, um, you know, moving all of that liquid around really is an expensive way to, uh, to transport. Um, it's an expensive way to fertilize if you're not close to your, to your fields. Um, what I found really profound about struvite, um, and there's a really uh, interesting um, 
work that was done. I, I don't recall who did it, but there's a big story about a project I read about in Nepal uh, where local mores um, uh, really prevent them from using urine directly in their garden. They just don't want to do it. But struvite, they found uh, this, this mineral form of urine um, is acceptable for them. And they've actually taken this small village in Nepal and produced uh, struvite and, and been able to ship it out. So they're actually generating income out of their community making struvite. Well, I just uh, couldn't stop there and had to make it on my own. So, <laughs> Uh, right here is my little jar of struvite that I made. I forget how much urine this is. It was, this was a long time ago. Um, but I made struvite by adding, I, I tried to make it a number of different ways, but really what you have to do is, is introduce a um, magnesium source. What you're going to find is that um, it, you know, the magnesium in your urine is going to uh, bind with your phosphate ions and it's going to precipitate out and there's not enough magnesium in your urine to completely bind with all of your phosphorus. So when you make struvite, you need to add magnesium. And uh, there's a number of different places you can get magnesium. I use magnesium oxide that I just bought online. Uh, I wanted to get, you know, as close to um, um, stoichiometry, uh, uh, the, really just the perfect um, ratio here. This stuff is dusty and it still smells like urine. Uh, I'm not going to lie. Uh, uh, so I use magnesium oxide. You can also use uh, Epsom salts, magnesium sulfate. Um, uh, something pretty cool uh, that I came across was um, maybe the, the best thing to use is seawater brine after sodium chloride is taken out. They call that bittern and um, it's very magnesium rich and um, uh, that, that's been touted as a low-cost way to use magnesium and urine and make a, or to use this bittern and, and, uh, and precipitate out more minerals from that. You're really essentially cleaning that water further too. Um, interesting opportunities with biochar here too. Imagine a uh, magnesium dope biochar and then urinating on that biochar and now you're really pulling in. Chemically, you're pulling in and you're, you're taking more phosphorus out of your urine. You're guaranteed binding up all that phosphorus in your urine. Uh, imagine a, maybe a biochar soaked in bittern, like seawater with the sodium chloride taken out. Imagine how mineral rich that must be. Okay, just a little bit about handling and storage. We're going to take a break here pretty soon. Um, uh, this is what I like to do. Um, remember I told you about closed containers. I um, this is what I do for my morning urine. Uh, I, I'm going to uh, confess here. I don't know if my wife is watching, but she doesn't even know what I do. <laughs> how I collect it. But I have my means and my ways of collecting my morning urine. And I'm using these old laundry detergent bottles. These are pretty cool because, for one, they have a wide mouth. If you take the laundry detergent bottle, most of them you can pop out the little plastic spout. And uh, these are almost, uh, almost a gallon um, to the top. So I don't go all the way to the top because I don't want to spill, but if I'm just maybe an inch or two above the top, then I, I can measure these out in single gallon increments, um, which makes it nice later for dilution. Um, yeah, I've got kids at home who are doing laundry all the time. I've got, got a dozen of these easily. Um, uh, either way, whatever you do, store in closed containers. Um, of course, minimize the handling for your own good, for your own nose. Um, wash your hands. And again, potential pathogens are, are killed in storage over time. Remember, um, remember your urine, is, it comes out acidic and it gradually becomes more alkaline over time. And uh, that's been shown to kill bacteria pretty quickly. Um, one thing that has not been shown uh, just on its own is, uh, is virus kill. So if this is something we're concerned about, um, Swedish research has indicated that uh, viruses actually take time and warm temperatures to kill. So um, the WHO recommendations for using urine uh, say that maintain one month at 20 degrees C. Um, I'm not good enough to know exactly what that is in Fahrenheit. 
but you can figure it out. One month, and, uh, and you can use it on processed food crops or um, fodder, animal feed. Uh, six months at 20 degrees C um, almost ensures complete and total pathogen kill. Um, so by their recommendations, what you can do is apply urine uh, on all food crops. Um, and uh, for certain food crops that are grown above ground, especially things like lettuce, um, pretty much everybody recommends uh, not applying within a month of eating. Uh, I do want to be very clear here. Urine is not uh, legal. And this, is, this was something that I, I really tried to research and really couldn't find a definitive answer on. But, um, you, you know, don't uh, apply urine to uh, produce that you're going to sell. Uh, WHO says, um, you know, use urine on produce, uh, you know, that you're going to eat. Well, sorry, not WHO. I don't want to put words in, in their mouth. But um, a lot of the... Um, literature out there says, you know, use urine on uh, crops that you're going to produce and eat within your own household. Uh, if you do want to share with neighbors, um, obviously make sure that they know that um, you, and that they're okay with you growing food with your urine. Um, again, uh, uh, these bottles. Oh, you know, one last thing about these bottles was, um, remember the shruvite? Now, if you're gonna age your end, you are gonna end up with a little bit of sludge here. Now, before you apply it, what I like about these small bottles, they're only a gallon, and I could pick them up and shake them real good and put that shrew bite back in suspension before, um, before applying. Uh, Rich Earth Institute, I shamelessly grabbed a screenshot from a video of, this is their uh, pretty clever collection device that they, I believe they sell them. I know that they offer plans on how to make your own. Uh, and I think they sell them as like a, a donation to the uh, um, to to their nonprofit, um, which of course I, I uh, adamantly would encourage you to donate to Rich Earth. There, um, uh, I, I really have shamelessly drawn a lot of work from them. Um, okay, so what he's basically done. What's unique about this is he's got this funnel, but what's pretty cool is that there's. Um, at the bottom of that funnel, right before your urine goes into that jug, um, he puts a ping pong ball that uh, effectively serves as a check valve. You can, you can urinate into the funnel and your urine will go underneath the ping pong ball, but then the ping pong ball will, will settle back down over the funnel and prevent gases from escaping out. Okay, so this is maybe a little bit more of a smell-free experience than what I do. Um, basically just urinating into those jugs. Um, I will say that I also keep, um, I keep five gallon buckets around. That's wildly convenient for me. And, uh, and I find that five gallon buckets with an airtight seal is a really nice way for, for collecting bulk amounts of urine. Uh, I would not personally want to get into a scenario where I've collected urine in a container. And I've seen many people that have done this, but um, again, I, I wouldn't, advise against um, if this is your first time thinking about fertilizing with urine. Uh, really put it in any kind of container that you can pick up on your own and handle. I, I would hate to have a 50 gallon drum of urine that I can't use. <laughs> so um, anyway, here you go. This is Rich Earth Institute and um, you know they do this, um, this personal collection. They also have a community collection program um, where they've gotten permits from the state that allow them to um, apply urine on pastures and do research on it in that area. At their large scale, they don't age their urine. Um, they pasteurize it. Here are those guidelines from the WHO that I um, had mentioned earlier. not required in dairy still at least okay um, fodder crops unprocessed fodder crops you can still get away with that low temperature but you do need that long storage um, higher temperatures mean you can reduce your storage time uh, my urine what I actually do is um, uh, currently any urine that I collect at the farm um, I, I store it in the um, solar biotech heated form that we have uh, and of course it gives you better light and all that stuff. 
you know, in much of the summer, it can be up around 100 degrees all the, or, you know, during the day. So it's great. Let's take a break. We'll come back to some more fun, exciting stuff here.
Thanks for hanging in there, guys. A lot of good jokes in the comments there. <laughs> I appreciate the the light mood. Um, let's see one one thing that I, I caught in the comments there on the break um, was about the uh, scaling up issue in pharmaceuticals. Uh, you know, of course, I'm not in a position myself to answer those kinds of questions, but uh, I will say that. Um, those kind of questions have been asked um, a lot recently, and there is quite a bit of effort going into research that shows that urine use, well, looks into the use of urine on large scale and large scale collection. Um, Rich Earth Institute, to bring them up again, is heavily invested in this, as is the University of Michigan, I believe. Uh, if you go on their website, you can read about some of their research um, work that they've done in recent years, and uh, and you can you can see that paper that I was referencing about um, virus kill or or sorry not virus kill but antibacterial resistant bacteria. Um, I would suggest that. Um, it, oh, also I wanted to um, let you guys know that the Rich Earth folks are doing their um, annual. Um, a series of webinars coming up here in the next couple of weeks um, where they'll be bringing in scientists from all over the world to talk about their research with urine. So um, that's, a, you know, I sat in through most of it last year, about half of it, and uh, was absolutely blown away by what people are doing. Um, too much, certainly far too much to even try to cover here in the next hour. But um, uh, yeah, if this gets you excited, then absolutely tune in um, in a couple of weeks to what they're doing. Um, can we bring up the uh, slide here? And we'll, we'll get right into it, y'all. We got a sprint here for the next hour, so. Can we go, can we go through the slide? Is okay now? Okay. All right. Um, so uh, we'll talk about urea and the hydrolysis of urea and how uh, urea is the enzyme facilitates this breakdown into ammonium, hydroxide, and carbonate ions. Okay. So what happens when you apply this? come into play here. Now you've got ammonium and um, uh, of course that's that's in water. That's in the water that's in your urine. And nitrifying bacteria would be across this line down here. Do the work of converting that ammonium into nitrates. Now ammonium and nitrates both are uh, plant available sources of nitrogen. So um, it, and I got into the weeds a little bit about this this morning and through a, a friend of mine talking about which, what, what do plants prefer? And um, from my understanding, and this is getting a little bit outside of my element, um, uh, most plants are going to prefer, at least the vegetable plants, are going to prefer nitrates um, to ammonium. Ammonium, I think, is um, preferred by some of the acid-loving crops, like um, you know, maybe blueberries. I don't know that for a fact. But... Um, uh, nitrates are, are generally what we're looking for um, for a plant nutrient. Okay, so uh, I thought this would be fun. What better way to show nitrification at work than uh, to talk about saltpeter? Um, you guys in the comments, raise your hand if you know what uh, saltpeter is. Okay. There's a, a fascinating, I'm going to go back in time here again. There's a, a fascinating story um, about saltpeter. Saltpeter being potassium nitrate salts um, used today in niche applications like uh, sensitive toothpaste, believe it or not. I think Sensodyne, the original Sensodyne, has saltpeter in it. Uh, more broadly used as a fertilizer. Used in the past for curing meats. Um, it's actually what makes cured meats red in color. 
Um, but uh, some of you, I'm sure, already know, primarily used as an ingredient in black powder and in jam. Saltpeter is naturally made um, when these conditions are met, uh, decaying organic matter. Alkaline base, potash, maybe lime, maybe limestone. Uh, moisture, sufficient moisture, but not too much moisture. It needs to be sheltered from the sun and the rain. And uh, a free flowing air, free exposure to oxygen. Um, these are the conditions where nitrifying bacteria are going to thrive. Okay, this is on the floors and the walls of cellars, stables, um, limestone caves where uh, bat guano falls and lands on limestone and it's nice and humid and moist in there. There's a little bit of air exchange. Um, I have a friend of mine who used to be a guide, and he could show you exactly where there are matted marks from where uh, children, presumably, would go into the caves and actually remove saltpeter out of the cave. And they were using this to make ammunition in the American Civil War. And um, the Minister of War, whoever it was at the time, uh, commissioned a um, Joseph LeCompte a professor of chemistry at the University of South Carolina in 1862 to um, write a manual for landowners in the South on um, how they can create their own saltpeter out of concerns that the caves or stable sources of saltpeter were going to dry up and they needed saltpeter to continue the war. It is very important, therefore, that steps should be taken to ensure a sufficient and permanent supply of this invaluable article. This can only be done by means of nitre beds. Um, so what I've done here is uh, set up a nitre bed of my own at my house um, last year. So what you're seeing here is actually my nitre bed, and this you might recognize that as an IVC container. That's about 100 gallons in capacity. Uh, that was pretty much full of a manure, a woody-based manure compost, uh, not yet composted, but, but on its way, uh, that I sourced and, and brought home, stuck it under my back porch shed roof where leaching is no longer an issue. And, um, and I began to urinate on it uh, all the time. <laughs> You know, a little bit every day if I could, or just whenever I was working in the yard, I could, I could urinate there. And um, what you want to do here is just basically keep it moist, but never, never, ever let it saturate. Never let it get too wet. Uh, you want to have a little drain there just in case it does start to pool. And um, again, that, if it soaks and it's open to the air, we know we're going to start to lose ammonia. Um, to the air and it's going to smell awful. So um, really we want to make sure that it's not allowed to pool and we want to keep it nice and fluffy and aerated and just adequately moist and out of the sun and the rain and we want to facilitate the rotting of this manure by feeding it more and more nitrogen, getting those nitrifying bacteria to work for us. Over time, over about eight months of this, um, you can start to see this crust developing here on the outside of this manure. And uh, those are, th basically that's telling me that I'm, I'm, I'm saturated, I'm there. I'm building up uh, what I believe, and I don't know this for a fact, but I believe that that is ammonium nitrate crystals. Uh, at this point, I have not added very much wood ashes. I have added some wood ash, uh, but not yet. So what I've done here with this ammonium nitrate it's uh, about a month before I'm ready to harvest. I will um, stop peeing on it completely. I'll let it dry up and I'll let this stuff crystallize on the outside. 
And what I did was scrape off maybe just the top four to six inches layer of this. And then I took that and um, uh, mixed that pretty heavily with wood ashes. These really um, white, unleached, pure, fresh wood ashes that I got from my wood stove. And um, potassium is what you're looking for here. Now, potassium will leach out of your wood ashes if, it, if it's allowed to. So you want dry, pure wood ashes, white, meaning it's low in organic matter. It's very reactive potassium. And um, I took that potassium and the, or the wood ashes, sorry, and the um, uh, material out of the niner bed, and um, I added hot water to it. And I wanted to get this right the first time. I'm not actually positive that you need to add hot water, but um, uh, I went ahead and did that and immediately raised the boiling point of this hot water. It was pretty fascinating. Um, uh, this, this, this bucket began to boil and froth and uh, lots of fizzing. Um, and what's happening there is the, um, uh, the ammonium nitrate. Now, I believe what's happening here is the ammonium nitrate is reacting with the potassium carbonate. And what you have here is all that stuff in suspension now in the, in the lay. What drips off of these containers uh, when, you, when allowed to, it, uh, the liquid's going to leach out of these little tiny holes in that bucket and it's going to fall, uh, fall down here into this collection vessel. And uh, you can end up with this thick, syrupy brown lay uh, and plenty of dissolved salts and uh, chief among them is potassium nitrate. Take that lay and you're going to boil it down. What you want to do is, is try to purify it as best as you can. And, and let me backtrack. This is all in that manual from Joseph LeConte, uh, which I've linked at the end of this presentation. Uh, you boil down that lay. Uh, uh, wh what's pretty cool here is that you're looking for different solubilities of the different salts. And potassium nitrate is unique in that it's very soluble in boiling water, and it's less soluble in cold water. Um, much more soluble in boiling water than common in sodium chloride. So what we're going to do here is take that, that lay and boil it about halfway until you start to see a sediment form on the bottom of your pot. And then you're going to take that lay and pour it off. And now, as that lay, lay referring to this liquid, um, starts to cool off, now you've, you've removed some or most of the sodium chloride and other salts. And now what's left behind as that water cools is it rapidly crystallizes. And that's what you're looking at in this bucket here. Or that, that's this lay after it's allowed to cool off. Uh, the next day I come in and pour off the liquid. Uh, and I'm left behind with a lot of really crude potassium uh, uh, nitrate crystals there. Um, and pour off that remaining liquid, let it dry, and here you go. <laughs> Here's what I got. That's about half of my original yield. I wish you could see that better. Um, uh, identified by its, um, you know, I almost don't want to pull it out because it's so um, fine there. Yeah, there we go. Notice the long uh, needle-like crystal shape. That is definitively potassium nitrate. Um, pretty cool stuff. It um, has a really unique smell. It does not smell like urine at all. It smells, um, it smelled a lot like, and I expect maybe this contaminated with the, with the potash, but it smells a lot like the potash. It has that kind of soft, uh, I want to say almost vanilla smell to it. Um, there we go. There's our crude saltpeter. That's a better photo. Um, How do you spell that name, Lay? Lay, L-E-Y. Okay. Uh, if, you, if you guys are interested in that whole process, I, I would say not to uh, promote myself any, any further here, but uh, shamelessly I would say check out the Waste Not Wood Ashes series. Um, you know, there's a blog and there's, there's videos coming out now too on it. So um, that goes into the soaking of wood ashes and then subsequently everything you can do with, uh, with the lay from that process, the ash water. Um, pretty, pretty cool stuff. 
Um, it's very similar to that process. Um, between reading that and reading Joseph LeConte's work, you should be all set to be able to do at least what I've done here. Um, LeConte does go into methods of refining this um, uh, using blood as a flocculant. Uh, it's quite a bit more detailed than something I'm willing to try to do at home. But um, anyway, what I have here, just to, um, just to be clear, is uh, not really refined enough to do anything dangerous. But um, I do, I do want to show you what I ultimately did with it, um, uh, which I, I'm quite proud of. And uh, I'll tell you a little story here, too, about the urine thing. Um, this is, uh, I, I had a friend of mine that I told this to, and, and he reminded me of it earlier today, which was, which was quite fun. But um, I, an aside here, I've got a lot of, of kids in my neighborhood. I live in a nice little suburban, everybody's got their acre type uh, development. And um, a lot of kids running around. And, and I, this is a, a major misjudge of, of character, but I um, assumed that the kids would kind of think that it was cool that I was making potassium nitrate from urine. I have never been more wrong in my life. Um, I am absolutely the neighborhood weirdo now. But um, let me show you what I did with it. And there it is. Just to prove that it's worth something, this is a homemade smoke bomb that I made with potassium nitrate sourced from my own urine. This is New Year's Day. Pretty cool, huh? <laughs> right. <laughs> All right, let's get back to something serious here. <laughs> uh, how do I get back? Next. Okay, of course we don't want to send all those nitrates up in the air. Um, this is waste not after all. But um, here we go with I'm sure what you guys are all here for. Um, practical advice on use in the garden. Um, I read in the comments uh, that a lot of you folks are already using urine in your garden. Um, congratulations. P please um, share more. Um, you know, if you guys are using it out there in the real world, then, uh, then uh, the more information, the better. I'll tell you, um, this, this is what I know. Um, uh, a couple of tips about urine in the garden. I've already spoken about avoiding volatizing. That's really what uh, the word, or, or my word at least, for um, um, applying urine directly to the soil where, um, where the, the ammonia starts to gas off and you get that smell. Um, that's, that's nitrogen loss. Again, when you smell uh, urine, that's, that's nitrogen going out, out, the, out the air. Um, you can avoid those losses by incorporating directly in the soil. A um, number of different ways to do this. You can apply directly uh, into furrows. You can, you can take like a row crop and you can just cut a little furrow to the side of your row crop, maybe six inches or so, four inches from the base of the crop. Apply your urine and then cover it pretty quickly. That's one way to do it. Um, you can just scrape aside your mulch. That's, that's one way that I do it at home. I'll scrape aside mulch, I'll water it in, and then cover it back up. Uh, most commonly is, is diluting the urine itself and letting the water carry it down. Now you just need to make a judgment call on whether or not you need to be watering your plants. Um, absolutely do not overwater your plants here. Um, urine in soggy soil is going to uh, denitrify and, and again you'll lose that nitro from, uh, nitrogen to the air. Um, and, you know, just as a rule of thumb, avoid spraying foliar. I don't think anybody would do that, but um, just, just don't. Um, uh, of course, not all crops are going to thrive with high nitrogen. Um, you, you really need to know your crop. You need to know how much nitrogen it needs, whether that's a test or whether that's just um, your experience in the garden. Uh, and uh, the timing of application is pretty important for most uh, crops. It's really you're going to apply during that vegetative growth stage. 
that's when most crops require most of their nitrogen. Um, heavy nitrogen feeders are your brassicas, beets. I was surprised to see that, but beets and your leafy greens. Um, urine, we've already spoken, is very low in potassium, rather low in potassium. Uh, a very common thing to do among homesteaders is to apply urine with wood ash uh, to, to try to make a complete um, balanced NPK calcium magnesium fertilizer. Um, that's great. That's great. One thing that I would advise uh, is, is applying those two things separately, um, peeing directly into a bucket of wood ashes. Uh, I have to imagine that you're going to facilitate this off-gassing thing a lot quicker. Um, but that's, uh, that's, that's your call. Um, um, yeah, nightshades, alliums, asparagus, which I've always assumed until doing this research was a heavy nitrogen feeder, but I, it, I suppose it needs a more balanced fertilizer. I will say that I, I fertilized my asparagus pretty heavily with urine this past year, uh, and it did quite well. Um, again, that WHO recommendation, do not apply urine within uh, one month of harvesting. Um, Let me say here that uh, I'm not qualified and I'm not here to advise on any large-scale applications. Um, again, everything that I've grown with urine has been experimental and for my own consumption, my own family's consumption. Uh, if my kids knew about it and I pray they're not watching, I don't think that they would even eat it. I'm, uh, like I said, I, I'm maybe a little more... Uh, Suburban than I would like to admit, my kids aren't accustomed to this kind of thing <laughs> yet, so uh, I don't know. That's maybe more than you guys want to know. But um, uh, my soils are also pretty, very high in organic matter. I had it tested and uh, was shown at 12% uh, organic matter. So a lot of my nitrogen is already coming from these slow release sources. Um, urine is absolutely not my only source of nitrogen. Um, I use it again, during that vegetative growth stage, and um, in the early spring. Uh, and this is, uh, again, I was telling you about the conversation I had with a friend of mine who's discussing nitrates and ammonia and what plants want. And, um, you know, I floated the question, and maybe somebody out there on the internet knows um, watching this, but, um, you know, my theory is that plants could use an early spring boost, certainly blueberries. Again, craving ammonium. Uh, when the soils are really just warming up and the biology is not quite that active. So my theory and, um, is that possibly um, the uh, urine is helpful for um, providing that early spring boost for, uh, for hungry blueberries. Um, let's see, Pat told me an interesting story. Pat, the director at Living Wood Farms of a gardener friend of his that came to him for advice about low fertility issues in their garden. And um, as it turns out, there was a lot of buried wood, buried carbon in the soil, uh, presumably maybe unfinished compost being buried in the soil. And um, all of that extra carbon, all that extra wood tying up nitrogen, uh, where regular applications in that first season of urine provided this counterbalance where where that nitrogen is there and now it's available, it's not tied up. And uh, what happened was the urine, the urine really provided that fertility boost where urine wasn't really necessary so much in subsequent years. Um, and they were able to um, ultimately wean off This is, is tracking down here along the bottom. This is tracking uh, stage of growth for corn. And you can see this B12, uh, I believe that, that what that refers to is, is how many leaves are on the stalk, something like that. But once you get to this stage, there's really rapid uptake where the plants are growing really aggressively. And, and they're taking up uh, so much nitrogen within a really short period. Look at this, 40 days in, 
to 80 days in. Look at between whatever that is, 45 and 55. Look at how much nitrogen is being taken up really quickly. What you want to do there, that's when you want to be applying your quick, fast-acting soluble nitrogen. Um, you do not want to be over-applying urine later in the season when your crop starts to um, you know, develop seeds or fruits or, or flowers and whatnot. Um, that's when you want to start tapering off nitrogen. If you've got rich organic soil, um, that's, you know, in my case, that's when I stop applying nitrogen completely and I just let my, my, my microbes do the work from there. Uh, dilution is a question that comes up quite often as well. Um, uh, do I need to dilute my urine? Is it necessary? How much do I dilute it? Well, I will say that uh, there's a, you know, a, a, a million different answers to this question. Um, what most people that have really studied urine have found that, no, you, you really don't need to dilute it. You don't have to. Um, unless you've got some obscene amount of salts in your urine, you're probably not going to see water damage. Most people are, sorry, damage to your roots from, from salts. Um, uh, is salt going to build up over time? Uh, possibly. Um, uh, I'll show you something here in, in a minute that uh, gets into detail about that. But um, most common your dilution, you, really the advantage of diluting is, to me, it's, um, it's a means of, of carrying the urine out over a broader area. We need to switch mics. You stop for a second? Okay. Yeah. So just one second. Just one second. I've already said everybody's just one minute. So don't take off his mic. Don't take it off. Just tell me what to do. Just put on this one because... Because we're having a big problem with that. But we got it worked out as long as we can. Because this mic is recording the high quality audio, but it's not sending high quality to... So we're going to use a secondary mic just for the so stream, just to like get to the right one. Cool. It's doing something funny. Mm Okay, is that better, everybody? Sounds good. Sounds Shall good. we go? Okay. Thanks, everybody, for hanging in there. Um, okay, dilution. So we, we were talking about, um, uh, do I need to dilute? Well, um, it, you got to make that call if you need to. Um, uh, like I said, some researchers have determined that no, you really don't need to dilute. Um, you, you don't need to worry about acute salt damage. Um, I did I did find, uh, you know, coming through what uh, other people have done, I found this really interesting um, uh, tidbit where somebody had, had posted, um, this is on the Walden Effect blog, uh, that one should dilute first to 1,700 parts per million total dissolved salts, or total dissolved solids, TDS. Uh, I'm assuming that this is management for acute salt damage from a single application. Um, for reference, my uh, aged morning urine, that, that really uh, stinky stuff, was um, 4,444. TDS. So if I want to dilute that to 1,700, I, I need to add um, four parts water to that. So I'm down to a four parts water to one part urine. Well, as a matter of fact, that's really what I do anyway in my garden. I was quite pleased to see that. Um, I do it because I want to uh, uh, really distribute the fertilizer more evenly across, um, across my garden and not really worry about... Um, really piling up too much nitrogen in one place. Uh, it, a, another recommendation I see often is dilute 10 parts water to one part for young and tender plants. Um, uh, here's some potential downsides to dilution. It really is just extra work and it's extra handling. On um, the large scale projects, um, 
you know, this extra amount is actually meaningful. It's more weight on your tractor. It's more mo volume to move around. Um, it might mean more trips on the tractor if you're doing a, a land application. Uh, here's a recommendation from Pat, director of Woodland Farms. Um, he is a longtime advocate of fertilizing the urine. And here's what he does. He applies it a, a, you know, a relatively very high dilution rate on his outdoor potted plants. And what he said was uh, he does about one quart of urine to five or six gallons. Uh, I believe that's about a 25 or 30 to one ratio. Um, and uh, uh, again, outdoor plants being the uh, um, what matters here. Um, we talked about do salts build up over time, and I wanted to show you this interesting map here. Um, this is a, a if my, my understanding of this is that if you are east of that line, that green-yellow line right down the middle of the country in the United States, uh, with the exception of coastal Washington and Oregon there, um, that uh, there is a higher precipitation to evaporation ratio. What this means is that your soils are going to be leach. They're going to leach instead of build up salts over time. Uh, this means that there's more rainfall than there is evaporation, and that if you're, again, east of the, the Mississippi River or east of the middle of the country there, that um, your outdoor plants, very little risk of you having accumulated salt damage in your soils. Now, if you do have accumulated salt damages from, from urine, um, really what you do is you flush. You um, do a nice deep watering on your outdoor garden. Now, in greenhouses or indoor plants or something, obviously this can be an issue. And, uh, and you, you need to, to learn to recognize the, uh, the issues with salt damage. But regular um, deep watering as opposed to um, uh, frequent light watering is your way to uh, take care of accumulated salts. Uh, here's something I, I wanted to get into, um, be, something that I never really saw that was clear and um, thought it would be useful for this workshop. How much urine do I need? Um, and that really, like I said before, that comes down to an issue of how much nitrogen do you need in your garden? Uh, so what I did was get a little soil test from my state, which does soil test um, either for free or at very low cost. And uh, I got a recommendation for five pounds of a 2000 NP kit fertilizer per thousand square feet. So uh, let's just say hypothetically, I've got a 2000 square foot garden and only half of that garden uh, even wants soluble nitrogen in the first place. So 20% um, uh, of something of five pounds really is what I'm looking there. When I say 20 it means add five pounds of a fertilizer that's 20% nitrogen. So I can work backwards there and I can say I need 20% of five pounds. I need one pound of nitrogen. If we use the rich earth estimate, uh, of 6,000 milligrams per liter nitrogen, uh, or six grams per liter. Uh, I need about 20 gallons of urine in order to make up this one pound. Okay, so uh, by their estimate, 20 gallons of urine is one pound of nitrogen. Five pounds, or five gallons, a nice five gallon bucket full of urine is uh, uh, 0.25 pounds, okay? I thought that was pretty helpful. Um, you know, again, that's going with the soil test recommendations. What I might do in this case is um, divide that over four different applications. I'm not going to apply all of my nitrogen at once. Let's say I provide that over four applications during the vegetative growth stage. Um, I, I've got those 20 gallons divided up into four or five gallon buckets. So what I might do at my home is, is one of two ways of, of applying that. Um, I might just take a five gallon bucket and pour off one gallon or two gallons and then just top off with water, have a uh, dilute one to four, one to three ratio, and, uh, and just apply that out of a bucket. Or I could get a little more fancy with it. Here's a photo of, of one section of my garden. 
And what you might be able to see here is, is a slow taper downhill. And um, I've got this 55-gallon uh, drum. Oh, off the, off the camera there. I've got this 55-gallon drum here at the top of the hill. So what I might do is add all 20 gallons of my urine to that 50-gallon drum and then just top it off with water. And uh, no, sorry, not all 20 gallons, add five gallons at one time. And then uh, fill to whatever ratio of water I think I need in order to irrigate my garden at the time. And then I would just drain out of a hose. And, and I would be very careful to fully flush the bucket or the, the drum in my hose uh, all at once. But I thought that would be a, a nice way uh, to do that. And, uh, and I will do that next year on my nitrogen heavy crops. Um, here's what I've basically done in the past. It's uh, similar to what Pat does. I may pour off a quart of urine and just fill up my one gallon watering can that you see here. And again, I'm not really here to advise on large scale applications, but um, here is what the folks in Sweden, I believe, were doing. Sweden or Germany. Um, trailing hoses on the back of a rather large tank. These trailing hoses are very close to the ground. They're really just dragging along the ground and depositing full strength urine directly to uh, what probably is a hay field. Uh, here's something fun. I wanna show you uh, real quick and aside the power of nitrogen fertilizer, soluble nitrogen fertilizer. Um, I told you earlier about my um, foray into um, growing indigo, Japanese indigo. I've read about that on our blog a little bit. Um, here are some Japanese indigo plants that I set out too early in the spring. Um, I thought we were well past our last frost and we had a May 1st frost and I made that Classic mistake that all amateur gardeners do and set my plants out too early. This May frost, May 1st frost, I even with these plants covered and everything, was enough to, to trick these plants into flowering early. It really signaled an early flowering. Uh, what I did to uh, ameliorate this problem was pick off the flowers and then hit them heavy with urine. <laughs> um, uh, three times I... Um, water them deep with one gallon of urine diluted into five. So I took one and five gallons and, and hit them hard. So what I did, I think, was an estimated uh, 0.2 pounds, maybe 0.25 pounds of nitrogen over an eight-week period. This would be an extremely high application rate on such a small area. Um, uh, again, also I want to note that I've got very high organic matter. Um, I'm not that worried about this nitrogen leaching out of the soil. Um, uh, again, very high organic matter and copious amounts of biochar in there. Um, but um, after those four heavy applications, oops, oh, I left out a slide there. I'm sorry, guys. Well, uh, basically after those four uh, heavy applications, I have a uh, uh, really healthy looking plants. If you can imagine really healthy looking plants. I actually got four harvests out of this crop uh, over uh, the next four to five months. Uh, each time this crop would grow up to 18 inches tall and I would cut at the base and then regrow and was able to um, actually extract quite a bit of indigo pigment. And if you guys want to see some indigo pigment, here's some of my homegrown indigo pigment. Urine was very helpful. Can you hold it up? Making this happen. Mm -hmm. Look at the screen. Really beautiful stuff here. Oh, sorry. Whoop. Can you focus on it? I'm gonna close up with my beard there. Yeah. It's set to manual focus. That's why it's doing everything. There you go. There you go. Okay. Anyway, you get the picture. I wrote about this extensively on our blog. Um, Check it out. Hold still. There's a really great. Um, there's a, a really great Facebook community of DIY indigo extraction um, enthusiasts. I, I would I think it's called Indigo Pigment Extraction Methods. I just want to say uh, thanks a lot to those folks. I wouldn't be able to do it without their help. 
Uh, anyway, yeah, so going back to that soluble nitrogen fertilizer, really, um, really powerful stuff for um, uh, putting plants, forcing plants back into a vegetative growth stage. Okay. Are we good? Can we get the presentation back up? Um, there we go. Uh, I saw this in the comments over the uh, break there too. Um, you know, if you don't want to apply urine directly to your garden, that's fine. There's uh, other options. Um, we'll compost it um, along with high carbon feedstocks. Now, if you add urine to your balance, 25 to 1, 30 to 1 compost, you're probably going to be adding too much nitrogen and you'll be um, facilitating nitrogen loss at that point. So if you want to add it to compost, just um, uh, add it to these high carbon feedstocks. Um, I do the uh, Johnson Sioux method with very heavy um, carbon. So a lot of that, there, and this is the uh, compost that I just harvested out of my garden uh, or just harvested the yield uh, uh, last weekend. It was very nice, very good stuff. Um, but predominantly leaves, some grass clippings and garden waste in there, but mostly leaves and this ramial chipped wood. And then um, during the wetting process, probably, uh, I want to say 15 gallons, maybe 20 gallons of urine went in there and uh, heated up very nicely and uh, made within about 12, 16 months, made a very nice compost. Um, uh, another way, very uh, popular way in the biochar world is to add it directly to biochar. Biochar has these unique properties, um, cation exchange, but also um, anion exchange. Anions being your, your, your phosphate ions and your, um, and your nitrogen, your nitrates and your ammonium. Uh, biochar actually, uh, especially high temperature biochars, have a, a really pronounced anion exchange effect. Um, and of course, you know, biochar is housing for microbes, um, harboring that nitrifying bacteria and the beneficial fungi that make phosphorus available. Um, adding to biochar, um, my, my theories about this is that uh, you're probably okay if you want to add to your biochar and, and keep it open. Um, evaporation, if you, if you urinate on your biochar bucket or whatever it is, um, which a lot of people do, uh, the more you evaporate off, assuming that your biochar is hanging on to those nitrates and, and ammonium ions, um, or the urea, rather, um, you, you really just, you know, you can really concentrate. With the biochar, you can concentrate the nitrogen into the biochar. Uh, if it starts to smell, that's, that's the point that you need to close it. Um, if it's submerged under water at any point, that's when you need to keep it closed. Um, I will uh, uh, do the P-char thing, and um, yeah, I will also add that to my compost. So um, uh, add, that, add that fresh. That's a really nice vehicle for getting uh, biochar into your compost and all those benefits of biochar and compost, and also getting extra nitrogen in there. Uh, here's what I do. If I haven't covered it completely, I want to summarize before we move on. Um, really what I'm doing. Uh, in the garden, I use that one gallon watering can, pour off a quart of aged urine, this is the sanitized urine, uh, out of my laundry bottles and use a three to one dilution. Um, most of the time I'm pulling aside the mulch and applying. I'm not hitting the plants directly, I'm a few inches away from the plants. Uh, I've got plenty of perennials and fruit trees and everything uh, planted in this ramial chipped wood beds. I'm a, a, Huge advocate of the ramial chipped wood methods. Um, I'll apply it a stronger dilution there. If I have extra yarn left over, I may even apply it straight. Um, I keep a few five gallon buckets, like I said, around for applying to these chipped wood beds and, uh, and for applying to my Johnson Sioux compost. Again, I keep these containers airtight. Uh, I keep the P-char. I actually use that when digging new beds. I, I don't apply, you know, my, my garden as it is, is pretty heavy with biochar already, probably five, maybe even 10%. And uh, I don't apply a lot of biochar now to my garden, but I keep P-char on hand uh, when planting new trees or if I'm building out new beds. Um, again, that slow evaporation there. 
Um, I mentioned earlier too that I keep my morning urine separate in laundry bottles and I, I keep that in my solar heated kiln. Those are, that's the urine that I'm putting in my hydroponic system. Uh, oh, there we go. Uh, that is the indigo photo that I wanted to show you earlier. That's uh, August 11th. That first photo was on May 15th. This is August 11th. And uh, again, I was able to harvest a full four times over the season, um, despite the delay from early flowering. So a very productive indigo crop, a lot of fun to work with. Okay, everybody, I'm gonna kind of rush through this because we only got about 10 minutes left. Um, but I do want to uh, showcase my work in anthroponics. Um, this is what really has me the most excited right now. Uh, anthroponics being basically organic hydroponics, um, uh, aquaponics without the fish. Think of it that way. We're, this is, this is a, a biological method of hydroponic gardening. Um, anthroponics meaning urine is my primary nutrient here. This is me. Uh, in I think February or January this year, and this is one of my oak leaf lettuces that I grew uh, almost entirely off of my own urine. Um, uh, very proud of that. That was my first harvest. Um, hydroponics in general, uh, you know, is nice because it's highly controlled. It's extremely productive and extremely nutrient efficient. Uh, I'm not worried about, you know, I don't need to get into the specific advantages of hydroponics here, but um, there is very little to no nutrient waste at all here. Um, uh, in the anthroponic system, these nitrifying bacteria that I described earlier are the, the engine. I'm adding um, aged urine, so I'm not adding urea directly to this, I'm adding ammonium um, and all of the other minerals in my urine, and I'm adding that to the system. And it's these nitrifying bacteria that are taking that ammonium and uh, making plant available, uh, you know, the stuff plants crave, nitrates. Uh, that happens on a biofilter. Um, biofilter really, in this case, meaning surface area, aerated surface area with moderate temperatures, lots of oxygen happening there. Here's a cutaway diagram of my current system. Uh, this here is a 50 gallon drum. 55 gallon drum. Uh, I've got holes cut in the lid here, so limited evaporation out of here. But uh, I've got three different growing methods here that I use. Um, one here is my media bed um, that is primarily a walnut shell biochar. Uh, walnut shell is actually being a little bit of a breakthrough for me. Um, a, a very nice um, biochar in that it's a uh, basically glass hard and it has this really kind of lava rock type um, texture where um, uh, lots of surface area there and it's rock hard so when you go rooting around in it moving plants around and digging you're not breaking your wood based biochar into dust like you might. Um, biochar media bed also I've got um, what we call the nutrient film technique um, this is kind of a fancy way of saying a, a pipe that has a uh, 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 running constant running water underneath it and this for me this is just a three inch PVC pipe with holes cut out of it and what I do here is pump out of the bottom of my reservoir up here and I split off some of that water goes into the media bed some of it goes through the pipe here uh, where it runs across roots that are suspended in little pots in those holes and then it feeds into what we call the deep water culture bed uh, and this is where we have a, a raft or some sort of a mechanism that uh, floats directly on top of the deep water culture bed. And your roots are suspended uh, in this aerated uh, uh, nutrient solution. Uh, so it's three different methods of growing. I wanted to try all three common methods out. Um, and you'll see that basically what I've, what I've come across is that I'm growing you know, different types of crops. Um, uh, using different types of hardware here. Um, this is very early on. This might be January of, um, of last year where I first got the system going. Uh, obviously too cold to do this outside. I've got it going under 
artificial lights that were donated to us. Um, thank you, Fifth Season Garden and Company, for donating these lights. Um, uh, actually donated them to our Repair Cafe project and uh, worked out very nicely for this. Um, uh, so uh, what I've done here, this, this bed up top here, this cut 50 gallon drum is my celery. So celery rooting very nicely in the biochar and gravel bed there. The pipe here across, um, lettuce doing very nicely there. Those are my loose leaf, loose leaf lettuces. If you look in the very back, that's the oak leaf lettuce that I, uh, the first one that grew very nicely for me. Uh, and then down here, I've got this old scrap piece of aluminum that I used and uh, just set it on top of my IBC tote. That's 100 gallons of, of um, solution in there. And I'm growing Caesar lettuces at first. Um, uh, essentially, early on, what I came across was um, basically... Well, I'll tell you what I did here. I sprouted these lettuces... Um, on their own in these little net pots with a uh, pine bark medium. And when they had their first true leaves, I went ahead and moved them over to the hydroponic system. And then I gradually, over the course of a week or maybe two weeks, I tapered up to what is basically a 200 to one urine to water ratio. So that's adding about, uh, I can't remember exactly how much, I think that was about two, maybe three liters of urine. Uh, and then I kept it there for a little while, and then I would gradually bring the ratio up over time. And I'm, I'm monitoring this uh, using an aquarium test kit, uh, looking at ammonia and nitrate levels. And I'm also watching pH very closely. Uh, early on, the pH was shifting all over the place and, uh, and really ran into some nutrient availability, availability issues due to a fluctuating pH. Um, Interestingly, over time, the pH has really settled out, which is uh, quite fascinating to me. Um, it's possible this biochar I thought was loaded already from a, a previous aquaponics experiment. Um, it's possible early on that the biochar was interfering with my pH and, and frankly, absorbing a lot of uh, nutrients. Um, a couple interesting things here. Um, you, you guys remember how I spoke about how urine was... Uh, pretty high in sodium and that, it, that sodium and those salts are going to leach out in the garden. Uh, well, in this system, obviously, they're not going anywhere. I have to pull them out. Uh, so that was my thinking behind adding celery. It's a sodium tolerant, really a sodium craving crop. Uh, so in this case, I'm growing celery or I'm growing something at some point that is going to pull sodium out of the system so that I don't get to uh, toxic levels of sodium. Um... Let's see, this really, um, at this point, uh, this really was a closed loop system. I'm uh, only adding nutrient and I'm only removing plants. I found that after about, mm, I don't know, two months of running this, uh, at that point I was really only adding um, urine, some wood ash and some kelp, soluble kelp that I was using for um, a potassium source and micronutrient source. Um, and I was running across, you know, at this point I was kind of flying by the seat of my pants, observing nutrient deficiencies in the lettuce itself. And uh, I will say that each, you know, in these early trials, uh, I was adding about one liter of urine for every one kilogram of lettuce harvested. That does not include the celery that I was pulling out. I never weighed the celery. I just kind of pulled it out and honestly, I snacked on it. Um, so never got to weigh in that. But lettuces, um, that's about what I averaged there. Um, at that point, I was going willy-nilly on, um, on the wood ash and the kelp, uh, looking for uh, or any kind of deficiencies. What I had not expected, this was really my first time doing hydroponic or really indoor growing at all for that matter. And you can see it happening here in this one right up front there. It's some, some strange leaf curl going on. I thought that that was a calcium deficiency. Um, what I believe it is now is, is these lights were probably actually too intense and I was maybe leaving the lights on too long. And uh, this this room that we were growing in doubles as our black soldier fly larva uh, container and we were artificially we were heating it from the biochar system 
uh, and, and no air exchange whatsoever. So I think I was running into possibly carbon dioxide issues, certainly very high humidity and a lot of light. I think it was an environmental problem. But uh, uh, my lack of experience judging nutrient deficiencies, I, I really got into some wild territory with um, nutrient imbalances. Uh, let me show you a couple more things about the system. Here's the walnut biochar as, go, as I was filling this uh, uh, vessel up. That's my inlet tube. That's an overflow pipe on the far left, and that's the uh, auto siphon there in the middle. Um, what I did have to do originally was weight this down with, uh, with pea gravel. A um, lot of surface area here for nitrifying bacteria. Um, and here's my biofilter. I wanted to show, I thought this was pretty clever and I wanted to include it. Um, my reservoir doubles as a biofilter. And um, I, uh, what we're looking for is extended surface area for, um, for developing biofilms that, that clean the water of suspended solids and uh, house that nitrifying bacteria. So in addition to that biochar media, I've included um, these nylon mesh bags. These are compost tea brewing bags. Um, one gallon capacity, I believe, maybe a two or three gallon capacity. But basically what I've done here is add about five kilograms of shredded plastic flakes. Um, and um, uh, close these bags up. And then I'm adding additional oxygen to the bottom of my reservoir uh, via air stones and air pump. Um, I have... Uh, yeah, here we go. Here's how I made it. These compost tea bags, and, and I've taken these, these milk jugs. Um, if you guys have followed our work for a little while, you know about my plastic recycling work. Well, we brought in a lot of uh, milk jugs for a while from a local dairy, and um, we was really proud to have been able to do this, but um, we shredded a lot of jugs for our extrusion and injection molding equipment. Had a lot of that left over. And uh, I've taken the equivalent of what became 80 of these milk jugs, shredded them down, and put one kilogram each into these bags. And now I have five of these bags floating around in my reservoir. And those 80 jugs shredded up, by my um, rough calculation, give me about an extra 250 square feet of surface area. Um, what's also pretty cool here is that the HDPE floats, and um, I don't have to worry about keeping it suspended in the water. Uh, you, really what's pretty neat is that it barely floats. So by the time it gets uh, these biofilms um, on it, it um, actually, uh, it's, it's very neutrally buoyant and it, it floats and bobs around in my uh, reservoir and gets hit by a constant stream of air. So uh, I, I went ahead and made a quick video to kind of show this action um, just for fun. Here's my biofilter. See the bottom action, you see my uh, guys kind of floating around here. That's a, a, a bypass valve there, which you saw there at the end. That's uh, I've included that for, for flow control through the beds in my system. That uh, falling water effect even introduces even more oxygen into the bifilter. Let me see how I can get off of this. Let's see that. Next. There we go. Okay, so here's some of my nutrient deficiencies that I was running across pretty early on. Um, I, um, while we were still growing indoors, I had these samples sent off to the NCDA lab and had them checked. And you can see both samples. I got a lettuce tissue sample and I got a solution sample. And you can start to see how off base that I got just by trying to go willy-nilly with it. Um, let's look at the tissue sample first. Uh, deficient in potassium, almost completely out of potassium. Uh, remember I said I thought we had a calcium deficiency? I've, I've gotten into excess uh, calcium, excess zinc. I was surprised to see that. Um, was very surprised to see low nitrogen. I was expecting to have, again, uh, paranoid about having high nitrate crops. I um, w was expecting to have high nitrate levels there. 
um, was surprised to see that they were um, uh, pretty low. Um, let's see down here at the solution, you can start to see again, very low on potassium, completely out of uh, manganese, completely out. And uh, getting to very high levels of zinc and uh, pretty high levels of boron. Um, sodium is actually, that, that 30 parts per million sodium is, uh, uh, I was actually pleased to see that. What that's telling me is that my celery was doing its job pulling out sodium. Uh, so pretty wacky levels here. Um, and it, it got me thinking that I need to send my urine off to the lab and really find out what we're working here. And uh, that's where I got my fresh morning urine analysis. And from that, I'm very proud of this work as well. I was able to get nutrient analysis from my wood ashes. Uh, I got the company to share the nutrient analysis of the kelp. And then I got uh, a few other soluble fertilizers, um, that magnesium oxide that I was telling you about earlier, and uh, borax for a little while. And I was able to come up with um, what is a, basically what I thought a balanced lettuce solution was. Um, so this is taking my urine and what it is, and then trying to match ratios um, of what are considered balanced solutions from professionals. And what I've gone with here is still a relatively low nutrient concentration from, um, what was the name of this book? I hope I have a note here. J. Benton Jones, Hydroponics Practical Guide. Um, he recommends these ratios over here, low end, for growing lettuce in a hydroponic system. This is the low end of, of what you would want to grow. So I built a spreadsheet here and plugged in all my nutrients. And uh, with, with that, I tried to get as close as possible, playing with all of the numbers to get a balanced solution. You can still see that I'm still relatively high according to his estimates on zinc. Sorry, the closer these numbers are to one, the more balanced I am. A higher number here means that I have excess and a lower number here, like in manganese, means I'm still a little low, okay? The trick here is playing with my urine and my wood ashes, which are, are wild cards. And then uh, kelp also being a bit of a wild card and trying to come up with something that's balanced. You know, playing with the micronutrients I found was, was pretty difficult to get something perfect. Um, again, what Jones considers high is still what the NCDA or Cornell University considers low. So I, I think that I've struck a pretty nice balance here. Um, still relatively high on, on phosphorus. Um, but, uh, okay, so how did I do it? I took, um, I made a personalized mineral mix with my own wood ash and my own urine. And for every liter of urine, I add 24 grams of my wood ash, 24 grams of gypsum, this is to get additional calcium in there. 15 grams, this is to get calcium without getting all those micronutrients. Let me clarify there. Uh, calcium without going into excess zinc, basically. I found zinc to be a real problem. 15 grams of soluble kelp, and then I had to add even more potassium um, because it, it, without micronutrients. So that potassium carbonate, uh, again, I'm, I'm really proud of this, that potassium carbonate actually comes from my wood ashes. It's been uh, separated from my wood ashes through that leaching and, and crystallization that I described earlier. Um, so I've found that, that for, for each one of those, I add, um, yeah, for each, um, sorry, each liter of urine. So what I've done is, is break that down so that I add um, roughly um, one tablespoon at a time. So if I'm here daily, I may add 250 mils, um, which I believe comes out to about a tablespoon. Um, uh, again, that ideal concentration is one liter of urine for 100 liters of water. Remember I said earlier that I'm adding one to 200. Uh, what I wanna work up to is one to 100. Uh, looking at nitrates there, I want to keep it above 10 parts per million nitrates, and I want to keep it below uh, 100. I don't want to get into to really heavy nitrate feeding. Um, uh, I also do add uh, liquid iron, chelated iron. Uh, here we are. Okay, so given that I was growing a lot of lettuce and it was actually going to waste, um, I uh, switched to lettuces. I did grow a couple of crops of lettuce outdoors. 
and had much healthier looking lettuce. Um, did not get those analyzed yet. Maybe I will in the future, but uh, rest assured it was very healthy lettuce. Nonetheless, I could not find people that wanted to eat it. Um, perhaps this is uh, the yuck factor of working with nitrogen. Perhaps it's um, uh, some bias against hydroponics in general. Um, uh, but I, I could not find people to eat it. I could not eat it all myself. My family did not want all that lettuce either. Um, so I ultimately switched over to Japanese indigo for fun, to experiment. This is the Japanese indigo that I grew for myself this year. And uh, again, astronomically fast rowing. Was able to harvest three times in four months here. Um, 32 pounds of plant material along with regular, I've switched over to Swiss chard here for pulling out sodium, regular Swiss chard harvesting, and still doing lettuces. You can't see it, but I have lettuces in, that, uh, in, the, in the pipe behind all of that indigo. Uh, that was 18 liters of urine between May 17th and August 31st. Um, uh, for the folks that are interested in, in indigo extraction, I, I can't say, you know, I'm not surprised that the indigo grew so incredibly fast. Uh, what I was surprised to see was how fast it fermented after harvesting. Um, probably a lot more water in these plants than uh, something soil grown, but uh, uh, fermented quite a bit faster, um, maybe in what would take me three days or even four days of my garden grown urine was uh, maybe a day and a half with this. Uh, each time that I fermented this, I did over ferments a little longer and ended up with a smaller yield. Um, any indigo uh, uh, processors out there, I, I would love to catch up with you and talk to you about this. All right, here's where I am today, right now. I've switched away from indigo. I've still got my loose leaf lettuces. These are obviously going into flowering now. Uh, temperatures are getting quite a bit colder. Uh, I've switched over completely to, to duckweed. All season long, I've been experimenting with duckweed uh, in uh, aerated uh, bins, non-aerated bins, different dilutions of urine going into each. And ultimately what I've found is the healthiest duckweed that I can grow is tied into my anthroponic system. It's uh, taken up nitrates and it's very well oxygenated and there's a slow, low flow through the entire system. Uh, I'm finding very fast duckweed, the mythical duckweed that doubles itself every uh, day. I haven't peaked there yet, but I can say that my duckweed is probably um, doubling every two days right now. Uh, so harvesting quite a bit of duckweed, I did wanna show you what my dried and harvested duckweed looks like. Um, here, I've just got a little baggie. That's not coming up very well, but... Um, I just want to hold it still for a sec. Sure. Yeah, let me open that up to get the shine off. Get the little going. I'm still in dry. See that? See, you can tell, maybe you can't tell from the image, but it's very dark green, and uh, it smells amazing. It's like a very, very sweet, very sweet. Um, Duckweed, I'm sure many of you know a little bit about duckweed. It um, grows very fast, um, grows even faster in, in nutrient-dense water. And um, it has the potential to um, take up a lot of nutrients and convert those nutrients to high, high protein, very high protein for a plant. Um, from, from my reading, duckweed protein content ranges from, uh, say, 15% to all the way up to 45%. Uh, you get to 45% duckweed, and now you've got a powerful, uh, powerful crop for feeding animals. Um, almost a, a, a direct analog to um, soy or fish meal and other environmentally... Um, uh, uh, dangerous crops. Um, so uh, what, I, what I really want to do here is prove that my urine fertilized duckweed is in fact a high protein duckweed. And uh, I'm rather disappointed. I have sent off samples to um, have 
forage analysis done and get, get my protein content back. It's not ready for this now, but um, please uh, watch the blog closely and I will post about it as soon as I get the results and get a chance to write up about my experiments. Um, but uh, I'm gonna end on this note. I wanted to show the duckweed uh, here. Um, kind of a, a field tested way of, of knowing the protein content of your duckweed is, is by looking at its root length. And this duckweed here on the far left is my duckweed grown in the uh, anthroponic system. This on the right is wild source duckweed. This is just uh, came up naturally in our irrigation ponds. So what I've done is taken this wild source and then just grown it out in our own system. So uh, judging by those root lengths, you can tell which ones are looking harder for nutrients, which one is likely to have a higher fiber content and lower nitrogen content. Sorry, not nitrogen, but protein. And uh, uh, again, very excited to get these results back and see if we can't scale this operation up and uh, start to looking at growing out a complete feed for um, poultry and fish. Um, that concludes my presentation. I wanted to leave these notes up here for you. Um, if anybody's interested in dyeing or saltpeter, or just ecological sanitation in general. Um, these are some great links for you to follow up on. Again, please uh, go visit the Research Institute and uh, if you're feeling generous, uh, donate and uh, check out their annual virtual summit. Okay. All right, I've got a couple of questions, Dan. Great, oh, questions. Okay, so um, is, is the morning urine more toxic than the other times of day? I know it's more intense, but is it more toxic? Like pharmaceutical wise, toxic. In um, general, how would you? S s uh, I don't know. I don't. You know, I don't. Y you currently use any pharmaceuticals, so it's uh, I, I, you know, I can't say. I can't say. I just want to stress again that um, uh, you know, I'm a, a practitioner, not necessarily a scientist in my own right, but um, I will say that there are. Um, credentialed and professional scientists that are working on these issues right now. But um, uh, pharmaceuticals, yeah, I can imagine um, likely if it's higher in most of the other nutrients, it's probably um, higher in pharmaceuticals. Or in well. toxins. It's just a question about toxins. But yeah, it could be pharmaceuticals. And then could you kind of do a synopsis on aging the urine and how long for the various uses as a recap? Yeah, we could go back to the uh, WHO recommendations, but um, it's basically at, uh, at higher temperatures. I think that 20 degrees C is probably um, room temperature. Can somebody verify that? Um, maybe 75 degrees, maybe 80 degrees, something like that, Fahrenheit. Um, I may be way off, but that uh, 20 degrees C, um, aged for one month at 20 degrees C gives you all but virus kill. And um, that's been shown, uh, according to WHO, you can use that basically um, basically on anything except for vegetables that you eat fresh. Um, age at high temperature for six months and you do get virus kill and you can use that on fresh vegetables. Um, again, you want to uh, no longer apply urine about a month before harvest. So for something fast growing like lettuce, that really means that you're, you know, you're applying urine at transplant, maybe one or two weeks after transplant, and then you're gonna stop applying urine. Um, uh, same goes for something that you continually eat, like uh, kale or something like that. Um, uh, again, Rich Earth Institute um, stresses that uh, if you are growing uh, food, using your own urine to be consumed in your own household, you and your family probably already share all these potential pathogens and um, uh, you're going to be fine to fertilize your own crops with your own urine. And uh, they, they again say do not, um, do not apply within a month of eating, but um, they also say that you don't even need to age your urine if it's for your own consumption. Um, that's a judgment call that, that you have to make. Um, uh, please, uh, I want to be clear that I'm not recommending that you apply urine on, on farms for produce that you're going to sell.
Any other questions? All right, thank you so That's much, it. Dan. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for letting me do this. Bye.